Hi everyone, my name's James and I'm one half of UK uh, dance and remix team, the Freemasons. Um, you may have heard an awful lot of stuff that we did um, a good few years ago. We got to the point where we were remixing the likes of Beyonce, Kelly Rowland. I think on Grand Theft Auto, um, Kelly Rowland's work still pops up. We still get emails about that one. Um, we've been lucky enough to um, work out of Brighton for a number of years and I've been incredibly lucky to amass this studio. And today I want to share some of it with you and also share some of the techniques that I found very, very useful um, in composition. Now, the one thing that we were always known for is that we were quite prolific. And it's because from an early age, I've been doing this now for 20 years, I learned a couple of tools that would help get arrangements going really, really quickly. And that's really what I want to share with you today. But also, as you can see, we're surrounded by some fantastic equipment um, and I've got some multi-sample set up. Um, and some kind of working methods that you may find useful in your own um, environment, even if you don't have uh, a great deal of hardware like this. Um, so look, without further ado, I'm just going to play you the beginnings of a little rhythm track that I've got worked out here. And we're going to talk about how we're going to put some extra parts onto it. We're going to get a bass line going. We're going to then start to add um, one shot sounds and a whole series of things from some of the analog synths in here um, and build it up from there. Right, so one of the things I want to talk about is this little diagram that I created here. And it's basically a representation of a measure of music. Now, at the beginning, we're going to talk about this in terms of a bar. So you've got 16 divisions on here. And you see I've marked this endpoint red. And for me, within house music and an awful lot of other electronic forms of music, this division is one of the most important. Now, as we expand out past a bar and we get to sections where we've got four bars, eight bars, 16 bars, and even 32 bar sections, for me, this is one of the most important parts. And if we concentrate our production efforts around this, it's very quick and easy to get out of this kind of loop hole that you can sometimes fall into, where you just can't see past the eight bars or 16 bars that you've actually set up. Now, I've also marked this one here, which is kind of halfway point in between. Um, and think about this in terms of an acoustic drummer, what he would do whilst he's playing. If he's playing through a verse, halfway through the verse, he may do a small drum fill. And then at the end, you get the big roll straight into the chorus. Now, although we're talking about standard music forms here and everyone may say, well, we're in, if you're in electronic music, this doesn't really have a bearing. But I promise you that it does. And learning the tricks that have been developed over hundreds and hundreds of years within standard music and applying them to your arrangements within electronic music can really help you um, build an interesting arrangement. Now, if I move over to the computer now, I've actually set a rhythm track up. It's quite simple. I'm gonna have a, I've got a baseline that I've pre-worked out here. Everything else we're gonna add to it uh, naturally as we go along. But as I say, the drum track is already pretty much there. Now I'm going to take you through the individual elements. Got a nice kick. Now kicks are one of the most fundamental building blocks, obviously, of anything, particularly if it's going to go anywhere near the club. And if you think of building a track like building a house, you have to start from a solid foundation. And the number of times I've um, talked to people about their tracks and they say, I just can't get it to work. And then you look at it and the kick's weak. And all of your decisions from the base, from a base end point of view, and therefore your overall perspective of a track, particularly if it's a club track or anything that's referencing club music, has to be connected to that one single instrument. So it's one of those things that don't think you've got to reinvent the wheel every single time. If you're on a specific genre of music and you've got a kick that you know works, then just stick with it. Don't, don't feel bad for using it a couple of times, because if you think about it, no one changes the strings on their bass guitar every single time they do a track. And it's a, it's a similar um, importance of instrument here. Now, I also have got a separate kick, which is pretty much exactly the same running underneath. And I've noticed within Tech House, and particularly in techno at the moment, there's these wonderful sort of reverberant kicks. Now, ours is quite dry at the moment. And I've got Ableton Link off, more of that in a minute. I'm just going to turn Ableton Link off so that we can fire this off quicker. Now, I've also got a separate kick here and I'm doing something quite clever with it. When I add the two together, you hear you get that almost warehousey sound. Now, I've heard that happen quite a lot 
um, on releases over the last few years. And you'd think it's ambience, but when you actually try to really dig in and get it exactly right with reverbs, it can be really difficult and you can be hours there. And what I find with kick drums or any, any drum sound is that the transients are so sharp, even after about five minutes on working on the sound, you can completely lose your way. So a nice quick way is if you've got the, if you can find a kick drum, um, say on a track or in your library that you like the sound of the reverberant, the, its reverberantness of, then actually solo it out, chop it out as a piece of audio and use something like, uh, here I'm just using Max for Live in Ableton's convolution reverb. And instead of a reverb, convolu uh, reverb impulse, I've got a kick drum, just a standard WAV kick drum with a nice reverberant tail on it. And it's creating. So before, after. I've done a bit of tailoring of the sound here. but it's get great for just adding almost warehouse atmosphere to everything. Now the rest of it, quite straightforward. Got a nice 99 clap. I'm just gonna copy that across a few times. Just a low subby effect. You see it's side chaining against the kick there just so I can have it in time, actually when the music's all playing. A crunchy old loop that I put through uh, one of the studio's old samplers, either the SP1200 or the Emacs, and it's got uh, some of the old samplers have a particular sound because of their low bit rate. Can be great for those kind of fill in drums, those loops that just sit in the background a little bit like soup and shuffle everything along a bit. And as long as you've got well programmed tight sounds on top of it, it can really help to bed it in. So I've got two little rhythm boxes here from two different generations of uh, technology. I've got an iPad, nothing particularly spunky about it. It's just a standard one, but it is running iMachine. But as you can hear from that, I've got its output plumbed into Ableton. Now, you, there's only one connection on this, which is the USB. Uh, there's a great little app called Studio Mux, which is like a, almost like a VST host, but for iPad for these um, inter audio application uh, devices that will allow me to run, I think, up to about eight devices and then pump out to different plugins on this. Now, bearing in mind, you only really want to run one at the moment. This is the beginning of a new technology um, and your iPad may not really uh, take kindly to it being overworked like that. But it will allow me, um, with the help of Ableton's link, to get this little shaker pattern directly into our production. Uh, so, just quickly nip into a, uh, to Live's preferences. Make sure Link is on, which it is here. Now this will cause Ableton to kind of behave a little bit oddly. It will catch up effectively with the thing that's playing. So I'm gonna start our iMachine here running and then start Ableton into record. Oh, sorry. I think this is brilliant. For, for the first time eight forever, we've been able to pipe the audio directly out of an iPad digitally straight into um, into any of the DAWs. And it works with a little uh, VST or AU plugin that allows you to run actually a multitude of different iOS devices um, and then be able to pick the audio up. And all I've done is picked the audio up using this generator. And then as that's a MIDI track, it's rerouted into a blank audio track underneath but our little shaker part is now totally active and ready to go. I'm just gonna turn the link off quickly here. And one shake is really loud. That was my bad programming on iMachine there earlier this morning. So 
So it's great. Now for the first time, if you're working on stuff on the fly, you're working on stuff in the, on the train, on your headphones or anything like that, you can now transfer it perfectly in sync into your DAW. Um, the second thing I've got here is one of the old Korg Electribes. Now, uh, the Electribe 2 came out recently, but this is one of my favourites because it's got two um, effectively guitar amp valves right in the top. And the more you turn the valve up, the grungier it gets. Uh, I've got a little pattern on this. that I'm just going to feed into Ableton. Now we're using standard MIDI clock here, this will pick it up automatically um, and it's just going out of the analogue world into um, straight into preamps and into the computer. But the reason why I've kind of got a little bit obsessed with some of these old rhythm boxes is you can actually just grab stuff, re-pitch, re um, send stuff on crazy panning journeys. I mean this is fun, this is just grab it and play. And sometimes that's what you tend to miss inside of the computer. It's almost like when you're going through sounds, you're um, kind of getting caught up in not so much the technical side of it, but your brain's thinking about four other different things at one, 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 at one time, when what you should be doing is concentrating on some of the sounds. Now, just going back to our diagram, um, you think about this part on one bar, at the end of one bar, which is where, particularly in house, you tend to put an awful lot of the ghost snares. And I got that one, which I'm going to just add every now and again uh, on the step sequencer, just on that last 16th to add a little bit of flair and a little bit of interest. Um, on any kind of house pattern like this, you want to be quite heavily swung, and I think I'm at about 50 or uh, sorry, 58 or somewhere between 58 and 61 percent. You hear that? Flip. Turn it off for a few. Right, so already we've started to develop quite an interesting rhythm track, and I'm just going to copy the first two bars of that loop across. And let's just have a quick check about what's going on here. Let's get rid of some of the inputs. And you see what I mean about that last division within this diagram. So almost here we're still at bar level. And I've actually done it on as part of a two bar pattern. But you see that last little section can be really useful to add a little bit of interest. Uh, I'm just going to quickly copy one of these across. The MIDI clock as it's run through the first time, I've got a slight delay on it, so the first half of the beat is just slightly out, so just going to repair that. So now let's look at our diagram and say, right, okay, if we're looking at this, we're pretending this is an eight bar section now, um, what I'm saying is here and here, we can add a little bit of interest. So. Going back to our screen, I'm going to use a double bass drum just at the end of the first four bar. And then when we come to the eight bar, which is the, what we've got here, I'm going to try and do something clever with our new loops. And I'm going to move that bass drum back so we get this effect. So let's look at that as a bar. Now, it may not seem much by itself, but when you actually listen to this now as an eight bar section, by looking at this diagram once more, you can see we've added a little bit of flair throughout uh, the whole proceeding. And it's almost like, as I say, what a real drummer would do, but it adds a, a degree of interest to what is what could always stand and just be a, a completely static um, eight or four bar section. 
Okay, so now the fun starts. And um, just before uh, the guys actually came in, I just wrote a small little baseline. It's nothing spectacular, but it will just give us a nice starting point. Um, and I'm gonna do this one in G minor. Now I'm always shocked um, when I see people that start and know which key that they're in or know what they've kind of roughly started, but still haven't sat down and worked out which notes are actually available in that key. Now this is really, really important. The rules are there for a very good reason. Um, people's appreciation of music or ability to actually um, hear it a certain way varies across the public. I mean, I don't know if you always remember at school, when I was at school, there was always a few people that were kind of moved down the choir because they just couldn't hold a note. But there are some people that hear music in such almost mathematically perfect terms that anything that's out can really, really actually upset them. Now, the majority of us are kind of sat in the middle. And if you're making music, I pretty much guarantee you, you're there. But the rules are there to be broken sometimes, but it's also good to arm yourself with knowledge. Now, G minor are, is basically these notes. So we've got two black notes. But we pretty much know anything out of that um, is going to fly. Now, the great thing about that means is that you can go on a bit of a sound design mission. And one of the things I've been doing just recently and taught myself to do over the last few years was to actually stop before I made a track. If I got the basics going, um, to actually sit down and say, right, we need to actually create some sounds for that in a specific key that I can then fire in, because it can be an awful lot of fun to have a series of sounds set up sounding great that you can just fire in as almost as if these are actually pad controllers. So let me just play you what we got. <laughs> And it's mainly three notes. We're kind of hanging around G a little bit, sometimes falling down to the F and then occasionally just down to the E flat or the D sharp, whatever you want to call it. So fairly straightforward from that. But then what I went and did was went through some of the incredible Reactor user library, pulled up a load of synths, got some of the bits from here as well, and started making a few things that I knew would work in G minor. <laughs> So it's almost as if you've got this bank of instant inspiration. And what I find it does is that when you go in and do it, it puts your brain in total sound design mode. You're not worried about trying to make a track. You're just interested in trying to make a whole series of sounds. Um, so it's almost like creating your own bank of one shots, but specifically for a given project. So you can, if you know the tempo that you're working at, even sequence a few things and then just get them ready to be chopped up. Uh, but whilst we're here, I want to now go through and start to add a few extra noises to our main bass line. Now, just a note about the bass line, it's actually a multi-sample from a hardware synth. Um, and what I wanted to do was to still have the analog warmth. And one of the beauties of analog, real analog, is that every single note is going to be slightly different. Um, in terms of sampler and contract libraries and things like that that you may have seen, there's a term called round robin where you take a number of samples of the same note, say five of each one, and then every time you hit that key, instead of hitting the same note, so you, you get a machine gun effect playing back the same sample, it will step through the actual the, the different samples of the same note and give you a slightly different tone each time. Now that's not available within Ableton, but you can trick Ableton into doing it. And I'm just going to quickly show you how to do it here. So here I've got a series of notes set up in the correct range, but they're all playing together. But they are different samples of the same note from an analog synth, so they're all slightly different. So they sound weird together, almost phasey. But if you open up in the zone editor, and this is only really going to work if you're using um, Ableton Suites and you've got the full sampler access, Instead of the, we've got three selections at the top here, which is the key range, the velocity range, and this selection range. And your selection range by default for any sample is all of the 128 different values. Now, if you select all seven notes and then right click on it, you can distribute those ranges equally. And I'm just gonna go through and do, uh, where are we, E2? We won't do all of them. 
you don't want to see me do this really across the whole thing. So I've just distributed those individual notes on the same key across this kind of internal selection range. Now you can hear it's pretty machine gun at, mo at the moment, it's still playing back the same sample each time. But now if we come to samplers modulation section, turn on the second LFO, you can use it anyone to be honest, I'm going to uh, speed the LFO right up to 30 hertz um, and then in the modulation destination, sample selection, which is this selection parameter. Whack that up 100%, turn the re-trigger on, otherwise it's just going to re-trigger the LFO, you want it to be random almost. Now listen. No more machine gun. This is where we were. Ooh. Exactly the same sample. Now, you get the movement, you almost get that analogue feel. And then it's perfect to fire into the filters and it can really help emulate the differences or the drifting between notes on an analogue system and that's exactly what's going on inside this patch with a lot of filtering. There's the selection ranges. You're already starting to hear those drum arrangement tricks starting to work. Now let's add to some of this fun with this extra bass sound. This is just actually it's a sample, a multi-sample of one of Logic's FM synths. time so once again swing is our friend and I'm pushing MPC swing at about 61 here copy this across Okay, now let's start to add a few bits and pieces to it. Obviously we want to kind of get a few more percussion elements and I've done some multi-sampling, or not multi-sampling, just individual sampling by creating a whole series of percussion noises on the studio's Jupiter 8. Uh, Jupiter 8 is a great machine and it also has a little known feature that will actually push stuff wide in stereo where you layer two sounds up or just have them in unison. All the voices are automatically panned within the synth and you can end up... creating a great series of silly noises. Now I'm just going to use another one of the banks here which is just standard sort of noisy cymbals. To just punctuate the beginning of this bar. <laughs> Okay, so this is somewhere where I see an awful lot of people getting stuck. There's a bit of a section going, you've got your main part actually working, but it still just looks like a selection of loops on the page. Um, and there's been much discussion about how to get past this. Um, some people say put a guide track up the top so you can copy the arrangement. For me, the best advice that I can give you is just immediately, when you're in a nice easy arrange page like Ableton's for example, is just stop looking at a loop. Now you can see automatically here I've put up at right at the beginning I've got a little bit of a breakdown section and an intro so let's leave them exactly where they are and concentrate on this bit and say how do we make the main part of this work well for a start I'm just going to select everything select an area of it which is the whole groove so far and just duplicate it by hitting Apple D or I think it's Control D on a PC three times. Then I'm going to say, okay, we may want to change a part of this one. I'm actually going to delete half of that. And we'll take the kick out from there. So what I'm doing really quickly is making some sort of arrangement decisions that you may have heard in other tracks that even though they're not fleshed out yet, will automatically get you away from that kind of loop stereo. Now we know that I'm going to put a breakdown in here with some other instruments later on. So 
Right here, I'm just going to leave it open for, say, for the time being, uh, say 32 to 64 bars. And then I'm just going to grab this bit again. Uh, you have to excuse, I'm going to have to actually insert some bits here. Ableton's automatic kind of length control can get a bit odd. So there's our breakdown section and there's our kickback in. Um, and maybe we'll have one extra little breakdown here. Don't worry about fleshing them out for the moment. And I'm just going to copy that last section and say, right, that's probably going to happen there. And then maybe we'll just copy the drums across. Now, how long did that take? Literally seconds. And already you're starting to look at a club arrangement page, a club uh, or arrangement page for a, a, a club track as opposed to just a selection of loops. And I guarantee you, if you actually take your material that you've got and just do this with it, even if you haven't got these sections actually set out, and even if it dramatically changed and you, edit up, you end up editing things out completely, like I'm just gonna take that bit out there, for example, I totally promise you, you will start to make club records an awful lot uh, quicker and much easier. So anyway, let's go back to our bit and start to add some, we'll do some percussion. And first of all, actually, I may just add some synth shots to this bass, so we've really got the underpinnings of the whole track working. So here's our groove. Now I'm going to come and automate the filters of those later on. It's always best to do that, I find, once everything's kind of working out. But one very important thing here is the bass line happens before the downbeat. So it's always on the offbeat, um, and it's always going to preempt the actual downbeat of the bar. So this means you've got to be very clever in the way that you actually copy all your bass parts across, because as you can see when I've copied here, there is actually a gap just there. Um, this is where I find Ableton's ability to automatically snap to this grid incredibly handy. I'm just going to select them and duplicate them in. That will fill in the gaps. Now we'll come back to the further sections later on. As I say, they're just there to give you a kind of uh, feeling that you know that you've got an actual arrangement going as opposed to just um, one or two loops. And let's go to one of our synth shot. So that's a fairly nice sound to start. See if I've got the other note. Yeah, I took actually all three notes. They're in a slightly weird order because they just kind of randomly went in onto a page. But as I say, forgetting the notes now, these are just a series of actual one shots effectively that I've created for this track. Let's see if we can start to add some of these bits in. Okay, now we know where the notes are now. Let's see if I can do that properly. Uh, great thing of that actual part is that it's all happening inside the bar links because I'm not using the first note. So I can just quantize that, get the right swing applied to it, and copy across. <laughs> Now, automatically now start thinking of arrangement. So I'm not going to use them for the first part. They're going to come in the second half of this, and then they're going to carry straight through. So already we're starting to build arrangement ideas up. Um, now let's add, let's have a look at some of the percussion samples. <laughs> So now back to our diagram where we had the kind of uh, the different sections. I think I've just got rid of it actually, but I'm going to add something here and then later on we're going to find another sound just to fit on the last almost measure. So we're looking at about four bars here. So I'm going to put something there and then something a bit more powerful at the end of the eight bars. <laughs> also going to do is just take the envelope down on this particular patch so that it has no release. 
which allows me to draw it right up to the bar line. Just going to quantize that. In fact, for the moment, I'm going to stick a oh, 16th note quantization on. So I'm going to take our analog percussion patch here. They're all quite nice and short and I'm going to feed one into an enormous reverb. Now I find Ableton's internal reverb just on its standard setting for percussion sounds can be excellent because you can really crank it up from a time perspective. And I'm just going to add a little bit of peaking EQ quite wide in the middle just to brighten it up. Bit of saturation. And now, as I say, we've been looking at this as an eight bar section. We've already got that small fill there. I'm just going to use the end of this part here. You see what I mean about firing effects into stuff? I mean, I even got a little bit of a double hit there. But firing into the reverb across that bar line really brings out um, a kind of almost funk into your actual programming. And I've been obsessed about this kind of what I call bar line work for years because it can really turn a lot of a lot of your productions around. Now, as I say, I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible and just use the internal tools of Ableton. So I'm going to extend the delay time of that a bit. Now, my favourite function, freeze and bounce. So if you freeze a track in Ableton, it will write down all of the effects. You can then right click on the track again where you found the fleet freeze and you will find the flatten control. What this will do is instead of you being able to go back and edit the part by turning the, the freeze off, you can actually just flatten it into a straight audio file. All of the effects are now completely wiped out and you can pull the, the audio section out. It will still have the same cuts as your MIDI part had in there. So when you do it for a whole track, it can seem weird, but it is one complete file. And there's a couple of things I want to show you with this which are really useful. Um, I'm just going to copy our first analog percussion. So now let's view what we're doing here. I'm just going to set the loops around this 32 bar section. So on the first time that we're using this reverberant hit, I'm going to kill the decay afterwards. So it's literally going to hit that and then suddenly drop back out. So it's almost like you're chopping the reverb. In the old days, it used to happen when you edited tape and you had reverbs kind of um, crossing the bar lines. And then I'm going to open it up for this one and we're going to do some clever stuff in here, maybe open up some of the filters a little bit. Um, but this is what you get. By And great function of Ableton is just be able to reverse something quickly. So what I want to do now is pull that uh, echoey sound straight into this next section. So I'm just going to select the part I want, hit uh, Command E, which will separate it. Same command as Pro Tools. Um, and I think that's a Control E on a PC. And I'm going to bring the second one over here, reverse it. And then edit it back in so that it comes back up at the end of this kind of uh, semi-break section. Now, as again, a, a little diagram, importance just to add production around there. Instead of it going right back up to that bar line, I'm going to pull it back to the clap before. And then I'm going to take the clap that we've got at that point, which is right there, create a new track underneath, take that clap, separate it out so that was the separate command which is command D on a, on a Mac uh, control E on a PC duplicate it by um, just bringing it down here 
then once again stick a massive reverb on it and something a little bit interesting let's do a kind of multi-poke eq reverb 100 percent wet and my utter favorite the frequency shifter which when you put it in ring modulation mode no sniggering at the back And I'm going to automate the frequency falling all the way down. And also automate the, the kind of mix control so that it's quite dry at the beginning. So you just hear the reverb, then you hear the modulated version of the reverb. Now this is going to be really useful later on once we go into the, break, the main breakdown. So I'm just going to add a little ping pong delay. Love the setting that it sometimes comes with. And a good old fashioned saturator just to smash it. So that's quite a dramatic effect that we've created there simply from a clap sound and a few of the stock plugins. But this is what it sounds like when you're with all of the effects now that we've added. Bearing in mind, as I say, once again, we're adding the production at this point, which are the last sections of each of the bars. <laughs> Now obviously we want something else to come in here, so let's have a look at some of our other drum sounds. God, we've got all sorts in there, let's see if I can get... It's quite random, let's see if we can do anything with that. I'm going to take some of the bottom end off. And if you can, for each part that you're starting to add, particularly in this kind of slightly grooved tech way, see if you can find its own little pocket of, of timing. And the only way you're going to do that is actually just to try and play it in. Might be able to get away with that. So quite straightforward at the moment, but once we start to add some other parts in, it should get a bit more interesting. So. Okay, back to our analog perk, see what we've got. It's going to create another track. Oh, what's going on there? Ah, that's actually been bounced, isn't it? That's not going to help. Me trying to play a MIDI part with a, an instrument on it. So I'm going to... use that as an open hi-hat if we can here. When you're actually arranging stuff, anything that you can do to bring extra top in as the uh, extra top end in as the arrangement builds um, will really, really help. So, you can kind of roughly see what I'm trying to get away with timing-wise here. Let's just tighten these bits up. That's good. A quick bit of joinery there. So 
So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video so far. If you want to see the rest of it, and also you want to check out the project files, including all the multi-samples from the analog that we've taken in the studio to, uh, to compile this, don't forget to buy the latest edition of Computer Music.